the worst drug disaster in history would spread through more than 46 countries and produce up to 20,000 badly deformed babies worldwide. But historians today single out one birth in 1961 that changed the course of history. In Hamburg, Germany, Linda schulte hillen aged 23, gave birth to her first child. Her husband wasn't with her at the time. And it was quiet there. And then I lay back and was relaxed, and some, I mean, somebody whispered into my ear, is your husband not all right? And I was here, wide awake, and I said, what, what's got, what has happened to my baby? Is anything wrong? Yeah, she said, just, mm, let's say, um, without any emotion. Um, yeah, he's just got short arms. And I, like a child would have asked possibly, I said, and aren't they growing anymore? And she said, this can't grow. This will be like it is now. And then I felt like I was beaten to death. A doctor gave the first time mother some friendly advice. Just get another child. Like, forget about him, you know? Throw him away, forget about him. Shortly afterwards, Linda's husband arrived and gave her some bad news he'd been keeping from her. Six weeks earlier, his sister had given birth to a baby with similar deformities. It looks alike, like our child. There must be something that is the same origin, the same difficulty, the same problem in the background. And we'll find it, and we'll search, and we won't stop until we've found. The epidemic of deformed babies began five and a half years earlier, on Christmas Day, 1956, with the birth of the first victim. In the small town of Aachen, Germany, a mother had taken a new drug called thalidomide, being developed by a local drug company, Camille Grunenthal. Her husband, like other Grunenthal employees, had taken home a sample, which he gave to his pregnant wife. The baby would be the first of six thalidomide babies, possibly more, born to Grunenthal workers in the years ahead. But the company ignored the early warning signals in their midst. None of that spurred Grunenthal to any action. Grunenthal didn't um, investigate, didn't talk to the mum, didn't go to the hospital, didn't look at the medical records, didn't contact experts. There were multiple opportunities for Grunenthal to cut the whole disaster short. None of them were taken. Nine months after the first deformed baby was born, Grunenthal launched the linabide onto the German market under the brand name Contragon. Grunenthal's aggressive sales force, whose motto was succeed at any cost, continued to promote the drug. Contragon, they claimed, was a safe sedative, especially for pregnant women suffering from morning sickness. Sales zoomed, and thalidomide became the second best-selling drug next to aspirin. But Linda schulte hillen and her husband, Carl Herrmann, were determined to find out what caused their son's short arms. Months later, they were no closer to finding an answer. I know my husband had times when he said, we won't make it. I think we have to give up. And I said, oh, we are not giving up. Her husband soon contacted a professor of obstetrics, Dr. Vidukind Lenz, who had received a few reports of deformed babies. My father and Professor Lenz, they traveled Germany in their old Volkswagen, and they went from one small village to another and uh, asked, are there any children with short legs or short arms born? And those kids were hidden away at that time in the small villages. And he, he asked in restaurants and bars and at the local police office, and everybody said, no, not in our town. And then he showed a picture of me and said, this is my boy, and can I please repeat my question? And then they said, well, at the end of the road, there has been a very sad incident. And then he went there and ringed the door and showed, the first thing he did was showing the picture of me and said, this is my son. Do you also have, have a kid like this? And the people burst in tears and, um, and children, the little my children were, were pulled to the day of light, literally.
In England, thalidomide was being sold under the brand name Distaval by the country's largest liquor manufacturer, the Distillers Company. As in Germany, distillers had received reports of deformed babies, but had been assured by Grunenthal that the drug was completely safe. Louise Mason was one of 530 thalidomide babies born in England over a six and a half year period. Louise only learned about the circumstances of her birth by reading her father's best-selling autobiography. I hadn't got any arms and I hadn't got any legs. And my dad said, um, it was like little flower buds, um, you know, from my arms and from my legs. My dad had a look at me and um, he said, my God, you're not gonna let this baby live. And they said, uh, yes. My mum was only 21 and she was advised by doctors to um, put me away and, um, concentrate on having uh, another family. After 11 days in hospital, her parents took Louise to an institution for handicapped children, where she would spend the next 18 years of her life. But Louise was fortunate. Her father had not asked another doctor to end her life. It is unquestionable that midwives and doctors were killing disabled children in the hospitals, in the delivery rooms, on a large scale, in Britain, in Germany, and if they're probably everywhere else. In Liège, Belgium, the mother of an armless baby decided her daughter's future was hopeless. This was the final day of the thalidomide trial. The baby's mother and four accomplices were charged with the murder of the child born without arms. At last, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Not guilty. All five acquitted. What relief and what a reception they got. In Canada, another armless baby was spared by a poor Ukrainian family in rural Saskatchewan. Years later, Alvin Law learned how horrified his natural parents were when he was born. Ultimately, it was the paternal grandmother who didn't want to have anything to do with this. She said, you're not going to bring that devil baby home with you. He's, he's uh, deformed because of a curse. The armless baby wasn't taken home after doctors warned he would never lead a normal life. But after six weeks, an elderly couple, Jack and Hilda Law, who had already raised their own children, volunteered as foster parents and got their first look at Alvin. And I took one look and I thought, no wonder nobody wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> and the next time I went to see him, of course, they had him bathed and dressed, and he didn't look too bad at all. Well, I wasn't in favor of taking him at all. No way. We'd raised our family and that was it. But it was a baby with nobody wanted him, so what are you gonna do? It turned out okay. My life story shifted the moment that Sophie and Peter, my birth father, gave me up. That, that, that is a profound chapter shift in my life. Because I went to live with the laws, my life became this life. In Cincinnati, Ohio, a deeply religious Roman Catholic couple with six children were expecting another normal birth. My mother's story is that when I was born, they were not at all prepared. The doctor said, Joy, your baby doesn't have any legs. So she says that she took the baby, me, and she said, well, Eileen is my four-leaf clover. I have a sibling who told me that my father cried and that when he came home, he handed me to my siblings and everyone got very upset. And they said, um, take it away. Um, 
someone ripped off the blankets and said, that's not a baby or something to that effect. That's not our sister. Um, that was what I was told as a young child. Um, painful. Eileen Cronin was one of several thalidomide babies born in Cincinnati, where an American drug company, Richardson Merrill, had their headquarters. Like the German drug company, Merrill promoted the drug as completely safe, even during pregnancy. Like Grunenthal, Merrill had no evidence to back this up. Merrill applied to the Federal Drug Administration in 1960 for approval to bring thalidomide onto the American market and was allowed to conduct clinical trials on patients across the country. Now, it wasn't a cl clinical trial at all. What it was was a marketing campaign trumped up to look like a clinical trial. Michael Magazanek is an Australian lawyer and former investigative reporter who spent years researching the thalidomide disaster. What Merrill wanted to do was to familiarise doctors with their drug so that once they got approval, they would have doctors all ready to go thrilled with the drug, ready to prescribe it like crazy. During this time, Richards and Merrill handed out two and a half million thalidomide pills to thousands of doctors in the United States and Canada. In Winnipeg, Dr. Claude Murphy was one of those doctors. We, we received it in quantities, like a thousand pills. A doctor was given free to pass out to his patients. There was tremendous pressure on it all over the world to get this wonderful new drug on the market and the companies that were producing it uh, even after there were came questions about its uh, safety kept right on pushing it. Dr. Murphy had good reason to be concerned about the emerging thalidomide disaster as he awaited the birth of his fourth child. His wife Peggy had been prescribed thalidomide by another doctor. I'd warned the nurses at the hospital we could be in for trouble. And we wheeled into the delivery room, and I went into the doctor's dressing room. And I turned and looked through the window, and I saw the nurse looking with horror at the, at the stretcher, you know, and realized there was something wrong. So I burst into the room, and he'd, he'd come a breach, you see, because of his lack of legs of a small bum. And his large head, there he was, stuck with the, on the stretcher with the, uh, just his bottom. So the nurse got me a pair of forceps, and I slipped the forceps over his after coming head and delivered him. And I, <laughs> if I hadn't been there, he never would have made it. So as soon as he was born, he started screaming. No hesitation at all. He's never, never stopped screaming since. <laughs> Thanks. I'd have to say I was pretty sh devastated by the whole thing. I'd never dealt with anybody who had uh, like physical deficiencies before, and, and then I had to to uh, break the news to the other kids, and did that the next day or so. How was that? It was uh, surprising. Awesome. <clears throat> well, they said, um, Dad, you got to bring that baby home. Thalidomide was now being sold in close to 50 countries worldwide. In 1961, in Australia, Dr. William McBride delivered three thalidomide babies in a few months. He alerted distillers, the British distributor of thalidomide, but they claimed they never received his warnings. And pregnant mothers like Wendy Rowe continued to take thalidomide for morning sickness. But when her daughter, Lynette, was born, Wendy immediately knew something was wrong. When she was born, there was just deadly silence in the, in the room. 
and I just knew that something must be wrong and nobody said a word, it was just loud silence. <laughs> and um, anyway, finally they said to me that there was a problem and um, that Lynn had no arms and legs and, um, you know, and they gave it to me and she, she doesn't look very different to what she does now. She had sticky up hair and the cutest little face. And <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, but I, yeah, it's just like, well, it was like a nightmare, I suppose, you know. But then I, you know, when you, you looked at her and thought, well, you, you've you got to love it, you can't, you know, you can't do anything about it. But they said, we think she's got some brain damage, but we don't know what extent. And I just looked at her and I thought, here's this little thing. No arms and legs, and if she's got brain damage as well, what hope have you got? They told me that I should put her in a home, that, that she would be dead in six months. We left her there for a week while we went away um, just to get our head around it all, and then came back to pick her up. And that was really hard, going back to the hospital to pick her up. In Germany, Grunenthal's advertising campaign was paying huge dividends. The company's owner and executives were making fortunes overnight, especially Heinrich Muchter, Grunenthal's research director. During the war, Muchter served as a Nazi doctor developing vaccines which were tested on Jewish prisoners in the Buchenwald concentration camp, many of whom died. After the war, Muchter joined Grunenthal. Nine years later, he invented thalidomide, and received a bonus for every thalidomide pill sold worldwide. The drug was such a success for Grunenthal that they started making money hand over fist. And Heinrich Muchter, who was on a percentage of profits, moved from being modestly affluent to having so much money pouring in, he could have bought himself a new Mercedes every month. By 1961, really, he's making 20 times his salary in turnover percentage. So he's getting this massive, massive bonus. He's become a ludicrously rich man on the back of thalidomide. What would a man like that, with a history of wartime experimentation, a strong personality, a massive income riding on the sales of thalidomide, what would one expect that he would do when confronted with reports of nerve damage and other side effects? I mean, it is not surprising to me that there was not a rush at Grunenthal to investigate, to get to the bottom of it, to put warnings on the drug, to withdraw it, to take all sorts of precautions. They did none of that. They just focused on selling more of the drug. In Germany, where the pills sold at a rate of 15 million a month, 5,000 children have been born deformed. From Stolberg, Germany, Morley Safer reports. In November of 1961, just 300 miles from here in Hamburg, Dr. Wittekun Lenz, the director of human genetics at the University of Hamburg, found an astounding increase in the number of deformed babies. He deduced that contergan, or thalidomide, was the cause. It was clearly going to take something or someone extraordinary to force Grunenthal to withdraw the drug, and that didn't happen until Lenz contacted them. He spoke to Heinrich Muchter and said, I have these very strong suspicions. I have 14 cases of birth malformations where I think it could only be thalidomide. I think you ought to withdraw the drug. Muchter wouldn't withdraw it. Instead, Grunenthal's response to Lenz was to send out reassuring letters to German doctors. Grunenthal sent out 66,000 letters to German doctors declaring their drug was safe. 66,000 letters to German doctors. I mean, you know, it's... That was a period where they'd been told that their drug was likely responsible for an epidemic of malformations and deaths, and they're telling doctors their drug is safe. And it really wasn't until the press got hold of it and they knew it was going to go public that they finally backed off and agreed. On November 28, 1961, a day after the thalidomide scandal made headlines in West Germany, Grunenthal announced it was withdrawing the drug from the market. Even if as late as the spring of 1961, they had taken the drug off the market then, they would have spared half the babies. Nico von Glasow's disabilities weren't so severe, but as a young child, Nico had trouble adjusting to his short arms. 
Also ich war eigentlich ein sehr ängstliches Kind. Ich habe viel geweint und also das kommt natürlich auch so ein bisschen daher, dass ich viel hingefallen bin und wenn ich, ich konnte mich ja nicht so mit den Armen aufstützen, bin immer boing mit dem Kopf so irgendwo draufgeknallt. Und es war einfach für mich gefährlicher als für andere Kinder auf den Baum zu klettern oder Fahrrad fahren oder und ähm, ich hatte einfach mehr Angst. Aber ich war innerlich, glaube ich, eigentlich fröhlich. In England, Louise Mason didn't see her parents and three siblings for months at a time. I was left alone most of the time. My parents had other children. There's no way that they could leave them with my nan because my grandpa was ill. So they just stopped coming. I went home three weeks a year um, for a week. One week in the summer, one week at uh, Christmas, and one week at Easter. Every holiday was like getting to know your brothers and sisters again. We had a lot of fun. When I was a kid, we had a lot of fun. I had a very good childhood. I mean, clearly, when God made me, he didn't have somebody making handstands on his mind. So the handicap came annoying from time to time. Even as a child, he was completely free. He was completely fearless. For him, it was natural. I don't see myself as, um, as disabled. Um, let's put it this way. I have short arms, and this can come very annoying from time to time. But uh, I'm not disabled to that I feel inferior, or that I think I cannot do certain things. In Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Alvin Law's parents decided the best way to get their armless son to cope with life was to turn his toes into fingers. For hours, Alvin was given manual tasks to perform with his feet. Now, granted, having no arms isn't exactly a, a rather simple disability. It's a very complicated disability. And I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a lot of work, a lot of work. A lot of time spent by myself being very lonely, being very afraid, being very frustrated. But I think it was the character that was built by my parents, especially by my parents, that allowed me to not really think that I was all that different. It's not an easy thing to get dressed, but again, it goes back to the basic theory of my life, and that is, do I have someone look after me, or do I look after myself? But more than anything, I think it's a mindset, you know, that, okay, there's a lot of people in our world that have way bigger problems than I have. So that I have to spend a little extra effort putting my clothes on, so what? The moment I started using my toes and my feet and my legs was the same moment I ceased to have a disability. In the United States, there would have been thousands of thalidomide babies like Alvin Law, except for the actions of one woman. Dr. Frances Kelsey, a Canadian-born doctor and pharmacologist, had just joined the Federal Drug Administration when she received an application to bring thalidomide onto the American market. Here was a drug that you know, looked like it should be no problem, but at the same time, there was just a feeling that um, there was something in the data or the absence of data that uh, was a cause of concern. The application came from Richardson Merrill, one of America's oldest drug companies, known years ago for its best-selling product, Vicks Cough Drops. I mean, Kelsey was extraordinarily determined, brave, tough, resilient. I mean, she kept knocking back Merrill's application. She kept telling them that there was not the testing to back their application, that it was substandard. They never managed to persuade her their drug was safe and fit for sale. Merrill poured on the pressure. They contacted the FDA 50 times. They went behind her back to her superiors. 
They complained about her in writing. They threatened libel proceedings. They pushed and pushed and pushed, and she was resolute. She was uh, unbelievably tough. Well, I know that we're all uh, most indebted to Dr. Kelsey, the relationship, the, the hopes that all of us have uh, for our children. Uh. In August 1962, President John F. Kennedy awarded the highest civilian honor an American can receive to Dr. Francis Kelsey. So Kelsey really saved the United States from a German-style thalidomide epidemic. I mean, Merrill was ready to go. Merrill had tons of the drug in the United States. It had already spread two and a half million pills around, around the country to doctors. It had a sales force schooled in the multiple wonders of thalidomide and all the fake inflated claims for its um, usefulness and its safety. And if Kelsey had given them the green light, the United States would have been flooded with the drug and there would have been a birth malformation epidemic in that country to rival that in Germany. While Dr. Kelsey said, I need to know more, I want to have more, I demand to have more, the Canadian government simply approved it. And I believe that was below the standard of what should have been expected from an industrialized, uh, first world country like very civilized Canada. Thalidomide continued to be sold in Canada for four months after it was withdrawn from the German market. The Food and Drug Directorate in Ottawa issued no warnings to the public while the drug remained on pharmacy shelves. The Canadian government and its Food and Drug Directorate could have done something four months earlier. And there are about 30 Canadians whose mothers took the drug after the whistle had been blown in Germany and after the Canadian drug companies knew that the drug was dangerous but kept selling it. I come home from the playground one day. My mom says, honey, good news, you're going to get arms, dear. I mean, you just remember a day like that, right? I, I thought we were going shopping, you know? Arms are us. I don't know. But I was very confused. They, they had hooks, and they were made of metal and plastic and wood. I mean, and I couldn't take off my shoes. I wasn't allowed to use my feet. Can you imagine how weird that was? So this became an interesting life. Half of my life was being Alvin Law, the kid with no arms. The other half of my life was this terrible victim of thalidomide. I lost my sense of who I was, right? Stick these arms on me. I'm not Alvin Law anymore. You know, Alvin Law doesn't have any arms, artificial or not. And why, why, why would I need them? I mean, there was no good reason, not one good reason, to use them. And for years I told them, hey, these aren't doing me any good. And it was like, shut up. That was how blunt it was. You know, we know what we're doing. You don't. Most thalidomiders don't use artificial limbs today. But Eileen Cronin is an exception. She wears artificial legs every day to get around. I was born with both legs missing from the knees down. According to my mother, I did adapt to the legs pretty quickly. If you have, you know, artificial legs, a lot of things go wrong. You've got to go around conducting your life, and yet, you know, you've got a skin infection and you've got to put your leg on. What are you going to do? Me, I put the leg on, I go. That's not always the best thing to do. But um, that's what I do. In Australia, artificial limbs proved to be useless and even dangerous for Lynette Rowe. These legs were designed for Lynn to walk in, but they were terribly dangerous because every step she took, she had to rock from side to side. The least little thing on the path, she would just fall over, straight down. Lynette required the full-time care of her devoted parents. For years, her mother's nightly routine was always the same. Good morning. Good morning. And, you know, getting up in the night and turning her and giving her a pan, and it's a sort of, it's a constant thing that, um, I talk to some young mothers sometimes and they say, oh, I've had to get up the night. I said, I've been doing that for 52 years. <laughs> the Rose are an extraordinary family. And when I went out there for the first time to meet um, 
to meet the family. Um, I, I found it profoundly moving. I mean, they were, you know, Lynn was 47 or 48 years old by that time. Her parents had cared for her as her primary carers for that entire period. Um, Lynn is catastrophically injured. She has a remarkable spirit, but she's catastrophically physically injured. And their parents, I mean, it's defined her parents' lives. Have you had enough? Thank you. Are you sure? Okay. In March 1967, the owner and eight executives of Grunenthal, the German drug company, were charged with criminal negligence, premeditated bodily harm, and manslaughter. Among the defendants was Heinrich Muchter, the Nazi doctor who made a fortune inventing thalidomide. One German historian has looked at a short list of, of Grunenthal staff from the early 60s, and he said it's absolutely astonishing that a small company should have such a concentration of, of convicted war criminals on its staff, unusual even by the standards of post-war Germany. Another top Grunenthal executive was Otto Ambrose, a Nazi war criminal known as the Devil's Chemist. Ambrose was convicted of war crimes he committed at Auschwitz, for which he served four years in prison. But after the war, the chemist found no shortage of employers, including Dow Chemical, J. Peter Grace, and the U.S. Army's Chemical Corps, before he became chairman of Grunenthal's board of directors in 1971. So in the 1970s, Grunenthal had as the chair of its board a man convicted of mass murder and slavery at Auschwitz. It sounds crazy when you say it out loud. I mean, a mass murderer as the chair of their board. The man who hired Nazi war criminals like Ambrose and Muchter was Grunenthal owner Hermann Wurz. Wurz was a member of the local Nazi party in his hometown before the Second World War a service for which he was handsomely rewarded by Adolf Hitler. The Wirtz family companies had actually thrived during the war years because they'd had a contract from the German army to supply soap and detergents. They had been supplied with slave workers. They had been basically handed two companies on a plate that were both either Jewish owned or Jewish controlled. Josef Neuberger was the personal lawyer for Grunenthal's owner, Hermann Wirtz. But in December 1966, Neuberger resigned suddenly and became justice minister in the province where the trial was being held. Grunenthal's chief defense lawyer ended up with the government responsibility for overseeing the conduct of the trial. That kind of stinks. And one German observer of the day said, this makes us look worse than a banana republic. Away from the trial, a secret deal was worked out between Grunenthal's owner, Hermann Wurz, and the provincial government. The secret deal was only revealed when the trial was dramatically stopped after two and a half years. Under the deal, volumes of the prosecution's evidence would be sealed from public view. In return for having all the serious criminal charges against its owner and executives dropped, the company agreed to pay the victims lifetime pensions ranging from $30 to $140 a month, as well as small one-time payments. But in order to collect the money, the litimiters had to agree not to launch any further suits against Grunenthal. So taken as a whole, the trial was a glorious, if unlikely, triumph for Grunenthal. Grunenthal really escaped from the disaster relatively lightly, given the scale and the scope of the tragedy. While Canada loudly celebrated its 100th birthday in 1967, the thalidomide families suffered in silence. A few parents had committed suicide, others became alcoholics, and some were having severe psychiatric problems. The thalidomide children were now school age, but the question that plagued medical and educational authorities was what type of school should they enter? Some experts recommended schools for the handicapped, while others advised the regular education system. In Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Alvin Law's parents had run into opposition from the local grade school when they tried to enroll him. School says, wait, he's got no arms. He can't go to this school. We don't have such a thing as integration. Mom and dad are going, what's integration? He's a kid. 
He needs to go to school. He needs to learn. He needs to be educated. He can write. He can read. What else do you need? The school finally agreed to take Alvin, but soon afterwards, he ran into a reaction his teachers expected and feared. I came home, and I was very upset because somebody had called me crippled. And I'd never heard that word before. It was never used in this house, and uh, it was never used in this neighborhood. But I go to school, and there was new kids. And someone called me crippled, so I had to run home, and I was a little freaked out. You know, Mom called me down, and that's when I first remember hearing those words that some people are born with black hair, and some people are born with blonde hair, and you were born without arms. Compared to Alvin, Moni Eisenberg's disabilities were relatively small. She was born with a short arm, but nevertheless, her mother was determined to hide it from public view when she was a child. Only years later did Moni understand why. Und hat mir dann immer so Ponchos und Mäntel genäht. Sie war Schneiderin, wo man meine Behinderung nicht sah. Das hat sie gemacht, um mich zu schützen, weil sie hatte Angst gehabt, dass Menschen auf mich ähm, zugehen und Schlechtes, also mir irgendwas antun würden. Moni's mother couldn't forget that the first victims Adolf Hitler and the Nazis rounded up for extermination were disabled children. She had lived near Hadamar Hospital, one of the extermination sites. Hadamar war eigentlich ein Hospital für Leute mit seelischen Erkrankungen und Hadamar ist ähm, umgebaut worden zu was hat bekam eine Gaskammer ähm, und es wurden ähm, die Tötungen, also das, der Mord an Tausenden an behinderten Menschen geplant und durchgeführt in solchen Einrichtungen. Und ähm, diese vor allen Dingen Kinder wurden mit grauen Bussen abgeholt. Man hat den Eltern vorher mitgeteilt, äh, die Kinder kommen in ein spezielles Krankenhaus, da wird es ihnen gut gehen. Es ist nie rausgekommen, die, für die Eltern war es nie klar, was passiert ist mit diesen Kindern. There was the hospitals where they were taking these disabled people to to be murdered that were really the test beds for the Holocaust. It was, it was in a hospital that the first gas chambers were being used for bulk killing of people. Also wäre ich im Dritten Reich geboren worden, ähm, wäre ich mit Sicherheit an so Orten gegangen wie nach Hadamar und wäre dort umgebracht worden. The medical staff of these places were very enthusiastic supporters, and I've seen a report from Hadamar Hospital where the, the chief of this program organized a party for all the staff when they had killed their 10,000th victim. In England, 197 families of thalidomide children were suing distillers, the British company which had distributed the drug. Distillers made a ridiculously low offer of compensation and warned that the money would be paid out only if all parents agreed to the lifetime deal. Five families refused the offer. They were led by David Mason, a wealthy London art dealer and father of Louise. Now, I came under tremendous pressure. I received threats on my life. Uh, I had a police guard for a period of time. I had anonymous phone calls, I had anonymous letters, I had, uh, you know, threats from parents. Her father's well-publicized opposition to the compensation created problems for Louise at her care institution. Up until then, I was sort of like one of the crowd, but after that, I was picked on. And that's when I felt like I was alone in a, amongst the crowd. Louise escaped the hostility of her classmates when her father took her out to participate in publicity events for his campaign. I was um, used as a, as a poster girl, not only because I was his daughter, but because I had the extremes of the disability. And visually, I had great impact. David Mason's campaign succeeded in increasing by six times the drug company's original offer to the parents. I did pay a heavy price personally, but if I hadn't have paid that price, the thalidomiders wouldn't have got the compensation when they got the compensation. So I think it was worth it. Thalidomiders were becoming teenagers, and in Winnipeg, Paul Murphy was having a difficult adolescence. He went to high school with other kids, and of course, he did have problems because he was rejected. He did make a few friends, but 
Uh, not very many. I think everybody's run into those kind of problems, but or just being told no, I don't want to go with you because of your situation. Not fun. Not a nice thing to have happen. Nobody likes to have that kind of rejection thrown at them. But there's some very frustrating times, and, and whoever says they've never felt almost self-destructive and not want, you know, geez, this would be a hell of a lot easier if I wasn't. And I've been to those low points. Luckily enough, I was able to pull myself back out. Alvin Law thrived in school, and by the time he was a teenager, he seemed to fit right in. As far as the whole scene of school has been, I think that's the most important part, is being accepted by people. If you're not accepted, uh, it won't be uh, worth anything. It was about acceptance, totally. And it was about asking two or three girls out on dates, to which I heard, are you kidding? I wanted to date just like any 16-year-old but I didn't have that good fortune. And of course, I used to blame it on the girls. And maybe it was partly them, but I know it was mostly me. I thought that I was gonna have to be a nun. I didn't think that I was gonna go on dates. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And that, that's not how it happened. I, I had a great high school run. I mean, you know, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of friends. I had too much fun. If you're like me and my friends, you drive around and you look for pools and you go skinny dipping. And that's what we did for entertainment. I never had a problem with girls. I could always get very nice girls, beautiful girls, intelligent girls, but I couldn't get the stupid blonde one. And I wanted the stupid blonde one for a one night stand. But that I never achieved. She was wearing glasses and I didn't <laughs> notice. <laughs> I found my now wife when she was 16 and um, maybe you call it a lack of opportunity but I'm still with her. <laughs> she was blonde and not stupid. <laughs> For most thalidomiders, getting behind the wheel of a car was the road to independence and freedom. Louise Mason was determined to drive, no matter how difficult it was for her just physically to get behind the wheel and do up her seatbelt. Driving instructor never instructed a disabled person, let alone somebody who'd got no arms and legs. But the tests we took was exactly the same as everyone else. There was no difference. It came so natural because I've been driving electric wheelchairs for you know, most of my life, and um, getting in a car was just a, a bigger wheelchair, really. My parents. They were the most practical people I think I've ever met in my entire life. So when it came to learning how to drive, that was just practical. That way you can get around on your own. You don't have to depend on people to take care of you. You don't have to worry about you know, taking a bus or using a cab. And it was really just about trying to figure it out. Anyway, I just love driving. It's one of my less. favorite things in the world to do. Most people don't consider the power of my mind. My mind is a very powerful tool, and it, 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 it interjects all kinds of things into my system so that my feet are literally my hands. So when it comes to driving, I take it really seriously, and I have high expectations. Why can't I? I can drive with one foot on the wheel. What is people's excuse? They've got both hands and their feet, and yet they drive like shit. This doesn't make any sense to me. In Germany, Nico von Glasow knew from an early age he had to choose a future occupation that would not require the use of his deformed arms. Also, ich glaube, so mit fünf oder sechs habe ich damit angefangen, irgendwelche Super 8 Filme zu machen, Fotos zu machen. I realized quite soon I never will be a conductor or a painter or a dancer. I can't sing, so I became a director because I'm, you know, 
I can't do anything else. Nicht. Nein? Gut. To pursue his dream, Nico went to prestigious film schools and apprenticed under the legendary German director Rainer Werner Fassbinder before making a number of successful feature films. But there was one prized job he wanted badly, directing a big movie on thalidomide. And the head of German TV said, no, you can't have the job. But you can make a documentary on uh, uh, thalidomide. And I said, you know, I, you know I, I, that was in Cannes. And I shouted at him. I, I used the F word very loudly and very often. Because I said, I apply for the job, you know, you pay well, and not a F documentary filmmaker who gets not paid, yeah? And that's so typical, you know, you give the disabled guy the side job, yeah? yeah. And then I went home, and my wife said, what's the matter? And I told her, they want me to do a, a film about thalidomide. And what do I know about thalidomide, yeah? yeah? And she looked at me and said, Nico, it's time to look the devil in this asshole. Moni Eisenberg was being raised by a poor single mother after her father died in a mountaineering accident when she was nine. By the time she was a teenager, Moni had become an activist against Grunenthal. If Grunenthal, as a company, can act in a way they have in the case of Contagon, there are really no boundaries between right and wrong. Over the next 40 years, Moni participated in protests and hunger strikes against the drug company. But there was also tragedy that occurred regularly over the years that brought Moni to the gates of the Grunenthal plant. This is a place where they spread out all this poison in the world and affected so many people and so many families. And it's um, let me always a bit shiver in the inside because it's touching me too much. So I brought letters and candles here to Grunenthal any time when I heard that somebody of us survivors indeed died. We need to remember all these people, all these victims of Grunenthal, and um, just to remember that we are still here. What thalidomiders didn't know was that the drug was still in circulation. Though Grunenthal had stopped producing the drug, thalidomide made an early comeback in the mid-60s when other suppliers began manufacturing it in India and some South American countries, where it had become the drug of choice for treating leprosy. By 1972 and 1973, we're now 12 years after the withdrawal of the drug, it's reported in use at 62 leprosy centers around the world and was clearly being used on a massive scale. One of the main countries using it for this application had been Brazil. And by 2003, there were, there were probably in the order of a thousand thalidomide babies had been born in Brazil across that period. And the ability to control this euphoric, addictive drug that's widely available in Latin America is impossible. So at this point, I do want to introduce my good buddy, he's become a good buddy, Timmy. Come on up. Alvin Law found himself in the public limelight when he became his province's spokesman for a handicapped children. I can be what I think I am, at least I think I can. Over the years, Alvin would make appearances on telethons across the country. At least I think I can. I think I can. I'm not better than other handicapped people. Because I'm not a handicapped person. That's where people get it wrong, right? They look at Alvin Law and they think, God, it's tremendous how he can do things with his feet. Well, I suppose if you look at your feet, it's tremendous. But these are my feet. These are my hands, too. And I have been doing it forever. These are not tremendous feet. These are the only thing that I've got. So when I pick up a cup and I have a drink, you know, oh, wow, what a thrill. That's not what it is. That's how I do things. You know?
Life wasn't so kind for another thalidomide poster child. Louise Mason continued to endure bullying from other kids at her institution for the handicapped. But one day, when she was 13, she was raped by another student. Louise went to a nurse for help. I was shaking, I was tearful, and um, they took my underwear off and uh, saw blood. And I tried to explain to them what had happened. But they did nothing. They did nothing at all. Louise endured five more years of fear and loneliness before finally leaving the institution. Then, like any 18-year-old, Louise immediately started to enjoy the freedom and joys of college life. I went to parties just for the sheer hell of going to the parties. I'd be absolutely cream cracker, but I'd still go because it was something that I shouldn't have done or wasn't allowed to do. I went to the pub regularly, drank lots of beer regularly. I got into trouble there. You weren't supposed to have boys in your room, and I did. Um, but I may say I got to vice president of the student union and got well respected. Unlike Louise Mason, who rarely saw her mother during childhood, Jan Schulte-Hillen formed a close bond with his mother from birth, and her unwavering support and encouragement were critical in his career decision. She never lost hope. She, she said, you, you, everything you want to achieve in your life, you're going to achieve it. I have absolutely no doubt. And when I, when I turned up with the, with the idea that um, that I wanted to be a doctor. Everybody told me you should not. It's not a very good idea. You cannot do that. You will have severe problems. She said, son, do your own thing. If that's what you want to do, you're gonna manage. Jan is now an emergency room doctor in Switzerland. I don't consider my condition as a major issue. I mean, I'm not a thalidomide in first spot. I'm, in first spot, I'm, I'm a man. I'm trying to be a good doctor. I'm trying to be a good husband, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a lover, and uh, I have short arms, and that's it. And, and if people have problems um, ex accepting me or, or have problems to interact with me because I have short arms, it's their problem, it's not mine. In Canada, most of the country's thalidomiders hadn't received a penny of compensation for their injuries. For 25 years, the Canadian government had failed to live up to its promises to look after the victims of this drug. So the War Amputees of Canada brought them to Ottawa in 1987. Unlike their German and English counterparts, the Canadian victims had spent 25 years separate and apart from each other. It's kind of interesting, finally after 25 years, to sit down with a group of people you're kind of related to and start to find out exactly what everybody else is doing. The Thalidomide Victims Association of Canada was formed with Paul Murphy being elected vice president and Alvin Law, recording secretary. After years of waiting, suffering and fighting for compensation, Canadian victims of thalidomide are finally getting the help they need from the federal government. Yesterday, the health minister said survivors of the drug will receive lifelong pensions. Individuals can now start feeling comfortable about their future. Um, they know they have a uh, uh, um, an amount of money coming in every year that can support them um, and help them. Hey, I don't know what your lives are like. Sometimes life can really be rough on people. I understand that. I get it. I've been in real life. Alvin Law is a motivational speaker who's influenced audiences in North America and Australia with his message of hope, especially to more than two million youngsters who've heard his talk. Speaking is the best thing that I could have ever decided to do. You're helping kids, and they need to have somebody come in and tell them that it's going to be okay. But I get such tremendous joy out of doing it. There is nothing in my life that makes me happier than speaking to kids. Nothing. And the next time you're ready to give up or quit or pack it in, well, if it helps even a little bit. Remember the goofy-looking guy that played the drums with his feet. But remember the words I live by every day. There's no such word as can. Thanks, and we'll see you again. How many people can say that they can go out and speak to a group for an hour and have them actually, you can see the change, you can see the reflection, you can see the thought that's going on in their mind as to what they've just experienced. 
Alvin travels over 100,000 miles a year on his own, but after 30 years on the road, his body is starting to wear out. It takes its toll, you know, carrying that stuff around. I mean, you know, my body uh, may not last as long as normal bodies do because of what I'm putting it through. I mean, as much as I make this look easy, I'm still putting my body through a lot of stuff. Just the pain in my back from carrying my luggage and scar tissue in my shoulder from carrying a briefcase for 35 years. And, you know, there's not really a shoulder here. So when I'm carrying it with, <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this. I should have like a Sherpa or something. Hey, how does a guy without arms function on the road all by himself? I carry my own luggage with straps. I check into hotels all on my own. I, I, I rent cars. All right, my keys, there you go. Thank you, boss. Right in my toes, thank you. All right, now, why do I rent cars? I, it's just how I prefer to function. I don't do cabs, because strangely, they don't stop when you go. <laughs> I'm still tromping around, going to airports checking into hotels, eating bad food, driving everywhere in the middle of nowhere, getting involved in blizzards and swearing at my wife for putting me out yet in another life and death situation and not thinking I'm getting paid enough. <laughs> See what I mean? I can get on a rant. But at the end of the day, she also says this line. This is a wonderful line. Honey, if you're tired of traveling, I'm sure there's a cubicle with your name written on it in a windowless office somewhere in the middle of nowhere for a mundane job that you'd hate in five minutes. And then it goes away. In Germany, Nico von Glazo had to overcome his lifetime aversion to other thalidomiders when he decided to make a documentary in which he and 11 other victims would pose nude for a calendar. First, I went to a disability school. And from that moment on, I wanted to have nothing to do with thalidomiders anymore. And then, because I made this film, Nobody's Perfect, I was kind of forced to meet them again. And I hated to make this film. Why? I didn't want to look at myself. Don't need any camera. Nobody's perfect changed everything. Very good. It changed how I look at myself. It changed the movement of thalidomiders completely. Because the first time, not lawyers, not someone else, not doctors, were fighting for us. Really big time, we were fighting. I think for me, for us as thalidomiders, but also for the public, something changed. The energy changed. Nico von Glaso, Palladio film für Nobody's Perfect. In 2008, Nico received the German equivalent of an Oscar for his documentary on thalidomide. Da ist eine Familie, eine Familie, die heißt Wirz, eine der reichsten Familien Deutschlands. Milliardäre. Und sie haben wahnsinnig viel Geld verdient mit Kontergan. Warum gebt ihr uns nicht davon etwas ab? Warum? But I still didn't get the money. <laughs> in college, Eileen Cronin fell in love with Andy, a graduate student in economics. I was in love, very definitely at first sight. Um, although, <laughs> I already had a boyfriend. You know, I immediately was drawn to her, uh, you know, her vivaciousness and intelligence and um, her wit. We moved in together. Um, and we got pregnant very quickly, <laughs> um, very quickly. I was racked with worry all my life about having a child because I didn't know for sure that my mother had taken thalidomide. I was kind of panicked. Um, it started to settle in. Oh my God, I'm gonna have a baby. I don't even know if I can have a baby. Um, I don't know if the baby's going to have legs or not have legs or something else, but also, literally, I did not know how I was going to carry a baby in my body. And so, um, they did the ultrasound. The ultrasound technician zoomed in right away, found foot, <laughs> one foot, blew it up, 
took a picture and wrote foot and then other foot, hands, fingers. And I was crying and all the interns started clapping. We knew that it, she would be okay. Anya and Eileen are best friends. It's, it's not hard to understand why Anya took up to be a, a ballet dancer because that's something her mother wanted to be when she was very young. When his first wife, Sandy, became pregnant, Alvin Law was terrified about what the future held. When I saw him come out of there with two arms and two hands and five little fingers on each hand, I didn't care what brand he was at all. I didn't care if it was a she or a he or an it, it didn't matter. And it was just the most tremendous feeling. It was my son. You wanna do it again? Back. I worried a lot about how I was going to play ball with them and how I was going to maybe, how could I teach them you know, to golf and teach them to play frisbee and teach them to throw, you know, I mean, all those things that you want to have a kid of yours do. You don't have to have arms to be a father. You don't need arms to love him. You don't need arms to be there. You don't need arms to listen. You don't need arms to be a father at all. Unfortunately, too many fathers that have arms don't realize that never forget that, and that's true. You just have to be there for him. That surprised me. The tears, I don't know, I'm not sad, I'm just, wow. <laughs> He's big now. He was little then. Yeah, boy, I miss that little boy sometimes, but that's not how life works, right? He's a normal, regular person. He's, uh, he's got the same regular personality, there's nothing really wrong about it and you just have to just have to know him and you can't just judge him by the way he looks what he brings and what he gives is much more so than anything arms could bring you know he he gives uh, great you know fatherly advice and he's a great role model he's a great person well, it's, uh, it's going well, right? and that's all you can ask my disability is not the most important thing whatever happened to me. My children are the most important thing whatever happened to me. Something lovely was the most important in my life, not something, you know, which went wrong. I don't think I ever actually sort of consciously realized there wasn't a moment or a time where I consciously thought, oh, my dad is disabled. Oh. And I never really had any issue with it. For them, it was the same like for Kiki or also for me. It, you know, when, when you are with me longer than, you know, a few hours, you just forget. There isn't much he can't do with me, so apart from maybe playing rugby, <laughs> there isn't much you, I can't do with him that I couldn't, couldn't do otherwise. He's a really good father and He's very, uh, a big character, <laughs> to say the least. Can I show you later? It's good to be rich. Yeah, I work on it. I'm getting rich by the minute. More and more. Why not? It's nice, you know, just bought myself a castle. Nico's castle is a 15th century home in Tuscany with 108 rooms, including 18 bedrooms. I'm very good with money. I mean, I invested at the right moment into Apple, and I went out at the right moment. Nico uses a lot of his money to finance charities in Asia, including an orphanage in the Philippines and a film school in Tibet. So rich people have the tendency to are stingy bastards. And I don't want to be one of them. Louise Mason had been a single mother for 10 years 
when she received a Christmas card from an old boyfriend. I'd heard that Louise hadn't been very well and sent her a Christmas card and come down and said hello, and I think the spark reignited is, is the best way to describe it. He, he kissed me goodbye, and butterflies were... I was sort of floating on, on a cloud, and he told his wife that he was leaving. She helped him pack the car, uh, and then he moved down here. We've been together since. And that was it. Flit and I have an understanding with each other. It's really weird, you know. Louise can nod at something, and you guys wouldn't know what I'm, you know, what she's on about. But I know straight away what she's pointing at, you know. Just a nod of the head or, or, or uh, a mannerism. You, you pick up, you know. The little more, you just pick up on each other. It's as though we've got a sixth sense. You know, it's really, really fascinating how we, how we, we communicate here with each other without even talking. So, yeah, you know, we, and I think we, I think we were made for each other, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I remember thinking, 28 years old, divorced, got a kid, losing my hair, gaining a gut, have no arms. What a package! <laughs> and then I got to thinking, you know, I've got to change this. That's how Alvin introduced himself to his future wife, Darlene, who was sitting in the audience one day. That conference was the first time I heard him speak, and it actually, believe it or not, sounds corny, but it was a life-changing event for me. I was in the process of um, considering making a final decision about a rather unhappy marriage. I thought, yeah, he's right. Life is too short. I have to make decisions for myself. I mean, anybody that sees her for the first time can't miss that smile and just absolutely melt. And I melted. I have friends who tell me that I smiled more the day of my wedding than they've ever seen me smile in my entire life, and it was permanently glued there for days. That was the beginning of the joy. It ended in that ring going on that finger. And it's still there today. Ah, oh, you can't even describe it. It's like all these years of angst and frustration just melted away in five minutes. You still love him? I do. It's kind of, he's kind of gross on you. <laughs> you know, life is never... She's passed her best before date, so she's got no choice. She's got to stick with me now. There's no option. Yeah, but he could do anything. Yeah, I don't stop traffic in her. <laughs> no, you know, we... we... We had our ups and our downs, and we've had some highs and some a lot of lows, just like anybody else. But it just keeps getting better. And I know it sounds cliche, but it's getting easier and better and more fun. There's a lot of credit that I get for doing this, but I didn't just do this. You know, I had my parents first, I had my teachers second, and then I had her. And those three elements of my life have been given. They've really been what has supplied the fuel for what drives me. Is that squirrel waving at us? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I met Paul on the internet, and uh, I got a message from this gentleman that had a kind of cute picture, so we started emailing back and forth, and uh, I came out to visit and moved. I fell in love quickly. Um, I never noticed his disability because it was Paul that I was interested in, the person that he is, and uh, his disability didn't matter to me. I always say he's the least disabled person I know. The words I live by are, there's always a solution, over, under, around, or through. In 1997, the Thalidomide Victims Association of Canada faced an agonizing choice. A small American drug company, Celgene, wanted to bring thalidomide onto the market as a treatment for leprosy and cancer, but needed the approval of the Federal Drug Administration in Washington. Celgene sought the support of Canadian victims for its application. If thalidomide can change for the better the life of a child with cancer, then let's produce it, and let's give it to these children, and let's make their lives better. And if it's because of the price that we had to pay, good, then maybe we 
can have some solace in knowing that it wasn't all in vain. In July 1998, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration licensed a thalidomide-based drug, but imposed the tightest rules on its use for any drug in history. Officially, Celgene got FDA approval for thalidomide to treat lepers, a minuscule American market. But the drug company quickly began focusing on it as a treatment for multiple myeloma, a cancer of the blood cells, and got approval for that use in 2006. Today, Celgene leads the market for drug treatment of multiple myeloma in North America and many European Union countries, selling its patented thalidomide derivative for approximately $10,000 a month, or $333 a pill. Most recently in 2013, a, a major survey was done by a team of scientists reviewing, they reviewed over 70 studies. The conclusion was that any benefit from thalidomide was very marginal and the risks were very high. In Australia, Grunenthal and Diageo, the British company that bought distillers, were co-defendants in a multi-million dollar class action suit centered on the Lynette Rowe case. Melbourne woman Lynette Rowe is suing the drugs manufacturer Grunenthal. The company wanted the case heard in Germany, where it's never successfully been sued. But the Victorian Supreme Court today dismissed that application. This was an application by the company that made thalidomide, the worst drug in the history of medicine, to have an armless, legless woman who has no money and doesn't speak German, if she wishes to have her day in court, have to move to Germany for the next five years. So we had Diageo and Grunenthal as our defendants. Um, Grunenthal have this never give in, never admit a thing, never concede, fight to the bitter end attitude. Distillers or Diageo took a much more um, compassionate, sensible, we'd say, approach, which was once convinced of the strength of the claim, they settled with Lynn. Grunenthal didn't pay a cent. We had to get up and face each day and every day and cope with the incredible damage that Grunenthal dropped to Lynn and our family. The settlement amount was a multi-billion dollar sum. It was a sum sufficient to provide Lynn with first-class care for the rest of her life. It really um, has dramatically transformed the Rose lives. Grunenthal refused to pay a cent of the multi-million dollar settlement, but two months later held a press conference so it could apologize to its victims for the first time in 50 years. Darüber hinaus bitten wir um Entschuldigung dass wir fast 50 Jahre lang nicht den Weg zu ihnen von Mensch zu Mensch gefunden haben. Stattdessen haben wir geschwiegen und das tut uns sehr leid. They apologized for some bullshit that they didn't reach out to us or some fuck, yeah? They never apologized for the suffering they caused. And they didn't pay for that, you know, for their wrong. There was no apology. Apology comes from the heart, yeah? Their apology came from their lawyers. We bitten Sie innig, unsere lange Sprachlosigkeit als das Zeichen der stummen Erschütterung zu sehen, die Ihr Schicksal bei uns bewirkt hat. Our family couldn't have gone into silent shock. We had to get up and face each day and every day and cope with the incredible damage that Grunthal dropped to Lynn and our family. <laughs> Grunenthal is still a privately owned company. The Wurtz family owns it today, just as it did in 1960. Uh, it does not have shareholders demanding returns. Um, the Wurtz family's personal fortune has been variously estimated at between two and three billion euros. Uh, it would not drive that family into penury or bankruptcy or poverty to loosen the purse strings and behave in a more generous fashion towards survivors. I not only want the money, I want the revenge. I want the revenge. You know, they, they killed 5,000 children. Yeah, they made another 5,000 children's life miserable. They made the life of 10,000 parents awful. Yeah, they are responsible and they should pay for it. Grunenthal no longer makes thalidomide and continues to deny most thalidomiders outside Germany any compensation. 
No survivors feel they have received an acceptable apology. Grunenthal refused to be interviewed for this film. Today, Celgene continues to prosper from the sale of its thalidomide-derived drugs to treat multiple myeloma. Prior to getting approval to bring its version of the drug back onto the market in 1998, the American drug company was valued at $100 million. Today, Celgene's value has soared to $100 billion. The original thalidomide drug is easy and cheap to manufacture and continues to be made and distributed by several drug companies and governments to treat leprosy. Unfortunately, it is mostly used in countries that often do not enforce rigorous controls and regulations. As a result, thalidomide injured babies are still being born. Thalidomiders worldwide, buoyed by the success of the Lynette Rowe case, have renewed efforts to fight for compensation as they battle with the continuing side effects of thalidomide.